The first scripture reading today is from Psalm 37, verses 1 through 6. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel today is from the gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly... When they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please be It's Transfiguration Sunday, the day in our liturgical calendar where we hear this story that Tom just read for us. It's an interesting story. It's got a lot of fanciness to it and kind of, uh, you can draw a lot of lessons from it. A lot of people think that the Transfiguration story is a misplaced resurrection story. This got smooshed into the middle somewhere. That is the technical seminary term for how that editing happened. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's a beautiful story. Uh, Jesus, you know, invites the crew to come up on top of the mountain. And so Peter, James, and John are up there with him. And then all kinds of fanciness happens. Uh, his clothes get really bright. And, 
and there's a voice that comes out of the sky and you know Elijah and Moses show up and it's all it's amazing and wonderful and strange and and it terrifies them they just absolutely freak out by having this experience you know Jesus has has taken them up here and shown them something they've never seen before Jesus has taken them up here on this mountaintop and revealed to them a little bit more of God than they even knew existed. Like, so if this is, if there's a lesson in the transfiguration story, it's just to remember that, you know, no matter what you think you understand about God, there is always more. No matter th what you think you have seen, of God at work in the world, remember there is always more. You know, th these guys, they, they want to, they, they're, they're so just amazed and overwhelmed by this encounter that they want to build these tents, right? They want to build a dwelling place on the mountain because every time we get overwhelmed by something, our first inclination is to try to define it and try to put boundaries on it, try to box it up. But it doesn't work like that, though. It just, it never works like that. Because God is always bigger than the houses we build. God is always bigger than the houses we build. Whatever those houses look like, whatever those boxes are, God's always beyond that. God exists not just here for us in our experience, but God exists everywhere. One might even say God exists across the universe. And, okay, so some people <laughs> went with me on that transition into the Beatles, right? So Across the Universe is a beautiful and amazing Beatles song. Um, and one of the things about this song is it just illustrates how far they went lyrically. Because I mean, these guys started out making rock and roll music and singing like, I want to hold your hand. And they ended up singing like, you know, limitless undying love, which shines around me like a million suns and calls me on and on across the universe. Okay, whatever. I'm a little pretentious if you ask me. No, but the, this song is a, it's an amazing and beautiful song. And to me, it does describe the sort of universal presence of the divine, even in ways that we might not be able to recognize or understand. The, the influence of transcendental meditation and Eastern cultures, especially Indian cultures and Indian religions is present in this song. Um, and, and the Beatles kind of got uh, some pushback for how universal they tried to make the experience. Some people criticize them. People still criticize whenever there's sort of influences in our faith from a different part of the globe, from a different culture. Uh, and, and since it's unfamiliar or different or other than, it, it's, it must be bad or wrong or we're at least suspicious of it. I remember one time a few years back in Springfield when a, a pastor in town preached a very famous, well-known sermon on the evils of yoga. <laughs> I kid you not, it's a real thing. And like, he was warning people about how if you do yoga, it leads you down to terrible places. I haven't stretched since. <laughs> um, But I, that's not my theology, right? That's, so, that's not my theological perspective. I don't, I mean, I'm not threatened by sort of other experiences of the divine in the world around me. In fact, I, my, like at the center of my theological understanding is that there's more to God than I understand. That there's more to the divine. Like if I think I've seen so much, uh, there's always more. There's a... a a quote that I can't remember who said it, but um, someone was asked sort of, it may have been Billy Graham, and I can't remember if it was Billy Graham or not, but it, someone was asked late in life, you know, some pastor, you know, um, what do they think of these other world religions? And their response was basically, you know, I've spent my entire life <laughs> trying to explore the mysteries of Christianity. I've hardly had time to think about other expressions of faith, right? So there's like, there's no reason for us to be jealous of the work of God outside of our own experience. And in this song, which describes the sort of universal presence of the divine, there's a, in, there's a, a Sanskrit phrase that's repeated over and over again, Jai Guru Deva. And uh, 
it is a phrase that means a lot of different things, but at its heart, it really is an expression of, of praise for one's teacher. And you can put whatever teacher you want to in there. So when I, when I sing it, I put Jesus in there. And uh, I see this song as uh, a call, uh, a call from God to sort of participate in this limitless and undying love that exists all the way across the universe. This is across the universe. May it be a reminder for us that God is indeed everywhere. Even beyond our vision, beyond our understanding. Words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither wildly as they slip away across the universe. Pools of sorrow, waves of joy are drifting through my opened mind, possessing and caressing me. Shai Guru which dance before me like a million eyes they call me on and on across the universe thoughts meander like a restless wind inside a letterbox they tumble blindly as they make their way across the universe Shai Guru shades of life are ringing through my opened ears inciting and inviting me limitless undying love which shines around me like a million suns and calls me on and on across the universe Shai Guru phrase limitless undying love which shines around me like a million suns is not a phrase that describes God's presence in the universe then I don't know what it is this transfiguration story is this big reminder for us over and over again that we talk about God using beautiful language. We can use the most poetic language available to us. We can use these words, the, the, you know, the light of the world. We heard it in our psalm today. Uh, our righteousness will shine like the noonday sun. Our relationship with God is like living in light. But, you know, it's just metaphor. It, it doesn't express the fullness of the divine. It never will. You know, it never will. Like every word that we say about God is really just us building a house up on the mountaintop. Trying to define, trying to explain. And, and that's okay. It's okay for us to do that. In fact, that's how we're built. We're designed to do that. We're designed to try to figure something out, right? 
God calls us to do that as a matter of fact, to try to explore the mystery. God has given us the gift of curiosity. As long as you remember that as far as we go, there's always farther. As much as we see, there's always more. As deep as we might understand, ours is just a glimpse. God is bigger than the houses we build. A preaching hero of mine by the name of Reverend Dr. Will de Gaffney calls the tr- transfiguration Mardi Gras on the mountaintop, <laughs> which is a beautiful phrase, especially because this always happens right before Lent, right in this Mardi Gras season, right? It's this party. She says, quote, it was Mardi Gras on the mountaintop for Peter, James, and John had stumbled on one heck of a party. There were strobe lights and sound effects and VIP gate crashers perhaps even the sound of a heavenly brass band. So of course Peter wanted to stay up there, right? Peter wanted to stay at the party. Peter wanted to stay on the mountaintop, but it just doesn't work that way. It never has and never will. God cannot be contained in a tent on top of a mountain. Reverend Dr. Gaffney says, if they just stayed on the mountaintop a little while longer, they might just forget there was anybody else outside their little privileged circle. Hungry, hoping, desperate, dreaming, waiting for them to come down and live the gospel. We stay on the mountaintop, we forget that anything else exists, right? And sure enough, as soon as they got down the mountain, the first thing they encountered when they got back to the valley (laughs) was an argument. Verse 14 of Mark chapter 9. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. What an experience that must have been, huh? Having Mardi Gras on the mountaintop and then coming down the valley and finding people picking sides and dividing themselves up from one another and arguing about something that I'm sure was oh so very important. There's always more than you think you understand. God cannot be contained in our understanding and and God cannot be contained in our understanding because the world needs to know God. Not just me, not just us. The world needs to know and understand God. The world desperately needs the limitless, undying love of God and it's our job to share it, not to build a house to keep it in. Because God is always more than our understanding. God is always bigger than the houses we build. And that works that way with people too, you know? It works that way with people. Because as much as you think you know about someone, there is always more going on there than you're aware of. As well as you think you can see another person, there's always more. As much as you think you know someone, there's always something else going on. And nowhere is this more evident to me than when I'm driving. (laughs) Because I'm the only one in the city that knows how to drive right. (laughs) Apparently. (laughs) Apparently. But you know, that car that's careening down the highway, you know, at 20 miles an hour over the limit, veering back and forth between lanes, they might be doing that because their daughter just had a car accident and they're on their way to the hospital. There's always more going on in someone's life than you think you know making assumptions about that other person's motivations, it impacts your feelings about them. I have very unchristian feelings about those people on the highway. I gotta tell you this right now, I, how dare they? Making assumptions about other people's motivations impacts your feelings about them, and of course your feelings about them impacts the way you speak to them or about them. And the way you feel about them impacts the way you act toward them, all because you have made an assumption about them, thinking that you know more than you really do. 
There's always more to people than you think you know. And there's a great example of that actually in Mark chapter nine, right after the transfiguration story, after they're back down in the valley, we get this story about the disciples who, who see this person over here who is driving out demons in the name of Jesus. The audacity. This person they don't know, who's not a part of their group, is doing an amazing and wonderful thing in the name of Jesus. And the disciples see that, and they come up to Jesus all proud of themselves and say, well, guess what, Jesus? We made him stop because he's not one of us. <laughs> this is one of those times in the scriptures where I really wish the narrator would tell us what Jesus was thinking in that moment. I don't know if Jesus cussed, but he would have then. I'm sure, <laughs> you guys, how, what? We saw this guy doing this amazing and wonderful Holy Spirit-led thing, but because he wasn't doing it like us, we made him stop. And Jesus says, don't make, what? Don't make him stop. If he's not against us, he is for us. Jesus is basically saying to these disciples, you made a huge assumption about this guy based on seeing one thing that he did. You made a huge assumption about him and it impacted your feelings toward him and it impacted your actions toward him and it's all based on seeing one thing that he did. You didn't go up to him and ask him how his day was. You didn't go up to him and ask him about his family or tell me a little bit about yourself. There was no relationship there. There is always more to another person than you think you know about them. And if that is true with people, <laughs> How much more so with God? How much more so with God? The Beatles are incredibly spiritual. Uh, religion and spirituality was an ongoing conversation throughout their career. They got criticized and analyzed and examined and John Lennon addressed that in a, in a book called uh, The Gospel According to the Beatles, which is given to me by a dear friend of mine. Uh, uh, John is quoted as saying this. People got the image that I was anti-Christian or anti-religion. I'm not at all. I'm a most religious fellow. Doesn't that sound like John Lennon? I'm a most religious fellow. I'm religious, he said, in the sense of admitting that there is more to it than meets the eye. I'm certainly not an atheist. There is more that we still could know. That's orthodox. That's orthodoxy. There's always more to God than we think we could possibly know. That's, that's the heart of what it means to be in a relationship with God, is that we don't know God fully, but only in a mirror, dimly. When John asked us to imagine no religion in the song, Imagine, he qualified that with the words, nothing to kill or die for. Remember, so he categorizes religion in the same verse as countries. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion too. He wasn't criticizing religion. He was criticizing violence. He was criticizing killing people and dying for a cause. John did not have a problem with Jesus. It was Jesus' followers <laughs> John had issue with. This put him in the same category as Gandhi, by the way, a very familiar and famous Gandhi quote. I don't know if you've heard it before. Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. <laughs> your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Hmm. So John's religious belief is that there is more to it than meets the eye. John's religious belief is that there is more for us to know that we still don't know. So we can talk about God, we can think about God using language, using metaphor, knowing that the words that we're using are insufficient. We can talk about God like the light of a million suns. We can talk about righteousness shining like the dawn. We can celebrate these glimpses. We all have these beautiful, amazing, and distinct glimpses of God, and we celebrate them, but we also balance that with the understanding that our glimpse is just that, a glimpse, a glimpse. God is bigger than our glimpse. 
God is bigger than the houses we build. That everyone's glimpse of God is just a little bit different and that God is present for everyone born. For everyone born, there is a place at the table. For everyone born, there is a place in God's love and light for each and every one of the glimpses that we celebrate together. A little bit earlier in the service, the kids sang a Blackbird, a Paul McCartney tune. It's a beautiful song. We are going to get a chance to echo the kids in just a little bit and sing it ourselves. But Paul wrote this song in the 1960s as a direct commentary on the racial justice movement in the American South. But it's a poetic song and can mean a whole bunch of different things. It's, it's very much a parable in that regard. Uh, I'm struck by the idea of um, take these broken wings and learn to fly because it feels to me like, like in a linear way of thinking that there's a step missing there that would be healing the wings. But the song is not praying for a healing of the wings. The praying in the song is that we would learn to fly with the broken wings. Also an image popularized by Mr. Mister in the 1980s. Gen X people, you with me? <laughs> Take these broken wings, learn to fly again, learn to live so free. All the people under 40 are going, well, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Also, by the way, and I did this research extensively on the research app Google, um, <laughs> I kid you not, the image of broken wings is also present in a song called Betty by Taylor Swift. <laughs> it's, it's there too. It's a beautiful image. It's a powerful image and it's evocative image especially as, as it's sung in this tune right uh, this black bird is singing and, and the prayer is that the, not that the wings would heal up right because healing wings that's for the mountaintop wings are healed on the mountaintop there's, there's everything's fine on the mountain flying is assumed on the mountaintop everyone can fly on the mountaintop the trick is flying in the valley the trick is flying with broken wings. And where are we flying? We're flying into the light of a dark night. Hmm. It's one of them there paradoxes, right? We're flying into the light of a dark night. I don't even really know what that actually means. I don't really understand that other than maybe the fact that there is a light that is shining in this world and no darkness will ever be able to overcome it somehow or other. But here's the deal, like we've been saying all morning, it doesn't matter if I understand it or not because God is bigger than my understanding. God is beyond my comprehension. And everything I think I see or know of God, there's always, always more. And so friends, Friends who have broken wings especially, um, I invite you, I think we have, yeah, we have the words, and we'll echo the kids' song from earlier together. Blackbirds singing in the dead of night, take these broken wings and learn to fly. All your life You were only waiting for this moment to rise Blackbirds singing in the dead of night Take these sunken eyes and learn to see All your Waiting for this moment to be free, Blackbird. 